tells us how to be blessed. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God doesn't want you to just have enough. He wants you to have more than enough. Amen. He wants you to be blessed so you can be a blessing to others. Amen. This is what he says in the word. He says, I give bread to the eater, seed to the sower. Well, what's the, what's the difference there? Well, there's two things. One, when he says, I'll give bread to the eater, he's saying, I'm going to take care of everybody. I'm going to make sure everybody eats. But bread, you plant bread, it doesn't grow. Okay? And so he's, he's saying, I'm not going to give abundance to the eater. I'm going to give enough to those that eat. But those who sow, those who give, I'm going to give seed. seed. Seed is a miracle. Seed produces more abundance. And so he's saying, I'm going to give abundance to those who sow seed. And I hope that's who you are, a seed sower. Because God wants to give seed to the sower. In other words, he wants to give abundance more than enough to those who sow seed. So this morning, as the ushers are passing out the offering envelopes, I want everyone to get an offering envelope. And I want you to sow good seed. Amen? What is a good seed? A good seed is when you pray and you ask God to correct you in your giving. And whatever the Lord lays in your heart to do, your faith is to do that. Amen? If you're obedient to God, I'll tell you, you'll be blessed. Amen. And so as we get ready to pray, I, I want you to, you have a prayer request right now that offer you a little, we're going to pray over you, uh, your, your needs and pray for your uh, desires. Amen? And ask the Lord to direct you in your giving and whatever the Lord lays in your heart to do, be faithful to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to return a portion of that that you've blessed us Take this offering that we're about to receive right now, Lord. And Lord, just multiply it. Multiply the gift back to the giver many times over. And Lord, let the offering be enough and to spare. Just follow the needs of the church. Let us make an impact in our generation. Help us to win the loss and disciple those that are saved. Help us to reach our community for Jesus. Help us to make a difference. And Lord, you see all the prayer requests written on the offering of those today. Answer every prayer. Heal every hurt, supply every need. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Speak to us, Lord. Show us what you want us again. In your name we pray. Amen. I want you to stand with me. I'm going to share a message with you this morning that has a, a peculiar name, but it's one that hopefully you'll remember. I, I titled the message Amalek at Rephidim. Amalek at Rephidim. And you'll understand the title as I go through the message. I'll be reading from the book of Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. It says that all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. That was the name of the place where they encamped. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wow, that's tough. And then in verse 8 it says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Amalek fought with Israel in Rephidim. The title of the message is Amalek at Rephidim. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, help us to hide your word in a heart that will not sin against you. Lord, let us receive from your word and let us be a reflection of your love and your life to our family, our friends, and our generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, Amen. You can be seated. We're reading about events that take place just after the children of Israel made their historical exodus out of Egyptian bondage on their way to the promised land. We see them now at a place called Rephidim, and there's no water there to drink. That's a problem, amen? If you've got no water, you've got a problem. But to add insult to injury, not only did they have no water to drink, but then the armies of Amalek attacked them at this place called Rephidim. Now, I want to remind you that a lot of the uh, events that took place in the Old Testament, if not all of them, are pictures and types of things that would take place in the New Testament and in our day today. For example, the Exodus story is a picture for you and, and for me uh, of salvation. The Israelites were, were born in bondage to Egypt. Pharaoh had power over them. He owned them. But they grew while they were in Egypt. And uh, soon they, they uh, began to have great numbers. They, they grew so big and their population grew and it made Pharaoh uncomfortable. He, he was getting nervous. He started putting pressure on them. 
And uh, the Hebrew children needed a Savior. Amen. And so they, they prayed for a deliverer. And God sent a deliverer in the way of a lamb that was slain. If you remember, they, the lamb was slain during that Passover meal. And they, the blood was applied to their doors. And uh, they left Egypt. They went through the water. The waters were divided. And uh, when, when Egyptian Pharaoh and the armies went after them, the waters came down and they no longer had authority over them because the one who owned them was the Pharaoh and he died. And this is a picture for you and I of salvation. See, we also are born in bondage to sin. And Satan has authority over us. And we need a deliverer. And God sent a deliverer in Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was slain from the foundations of the world. And the blood is applied to our life when we accept Jesus as Lord. And then we're baptized by dividing the water. Amen. Being baptized by immersion in the water. The water separates. And we come out a new creature in Christ. And the devil no longer has authority over us. So, so we see that the Exodus was a picture of salvation. And throughout history, God has given us pictures of salvation. In fact, every time a child is born, we see this picture again of the Exodus. We see this picture of salvation. Before a child is born, it grows in the mother's womb. Pretty soon it begins to get too big. And birth, pain, birth pains take place. There's pressure put on the child. Soon there's a showing of blood. And then what happens? The mother says, my water broke. Okay? Picture of baptism. And a new child is born. That's what happened in Israel. Israel grew in the, the womb of Egypt until they were too numerous. Then the Pharaoh put pressure on them. Birth pains, birth pains began to take place. Then there was a showing of blood. The water broke and a new nation was birthed. All these are pictures of salvation. And when Moses and the children of Israel entered into the wilderness, the first place that the enemy attempted to destroy them, the first place he attacked them, was in a place called Rephidim, where Amalek attacked them. Now who is Amalek? Amalek in the Bible is a picture of sin. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. And I don't know if you remember Jacob and Esau, but Esau was the one who uh, sold his birthright for a bowl of wolf brand chili or something like that. And the Bible calls it pottage. But I, it said it was a red chili. When I, I think of that, I think of wolf brand chili. Amen. And I know wolf brand chili is good, but man, I don't know if it's worth selling your birthright over. Amen. And Esau sold his birthright to satisfy the flesh. What do you think about that? He sold his birthright to satisfy the flesh. Sometimes we sell out to please the flesh. We know what God wants us to do. We know it's smart to be obedient to God. But sometimes we sell out just for a little pleasure. For the spur of the moment. Throughout the Bible, Amalek and his descendants represent the natural man, the sinful man. Here we see Moses and the Hebrew children headed for the promised land. That's a picture of us headed for heaven. That's our promised land. But the enemy attacks him in a place called Rephidim. Now, the, the word Rephidim is an interesting uh, word. It means a resting place. It's where you make your bed. It means to be lazy or to let down your hands. And you might, that, that might remind you of this historic battle. See, this is the battle where Moses was on a hilltop and he told Joshua, you take the army down there and fight. And I'm going to be up here holding the, the rod of God and my hand up in the air. And as long as Moses' hands were up, Joshua would win the battle. But when Moses would get tired and put his hands down for a break, Joshua would start losing the battle. And Moses would put his hands back up and start worshiping God. And as long as Moses' hands were up, Joshua would start winning the battle. But when Moses' hands got heavy, and he put him down, Joshua would start losing the battle. And so when Joshua was losing the battle, they said, we need help. They didn't send help down there. They sent help up here to Moses. And Aaron and Hur held his hands up. And they sat him down on the rock so he could get him right and keep his hands up. And they kept his hands up until Yeshua down there won the battle. Well, that's a great picture for us. I want to tell you something. Yeshua is the one fighting the battle. The battle's not ours. Amen. The battle is the Lord's. And as long as the Lord's fighting your battle, you're going to win. Amen. But you've got to worship God. Amen. That's your job is up here. And what happens up here is going to affect what goes on down there. Amen. 
Yeshua is going to fight for you. All you got to do is worship Him. Amen. And as long as He's the one doing the fighting, you got nothing to worry about. You're going to win this battle. Amen. In Exodus 17, verse 8, it says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of a hill with the rod of God in my hand. And so Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, and Moses held his hand up, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. And his hands were steady until they're going down to the sun. And Joshua defeated or discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Wow. That battle that took place there in the Old Testament is a picture of a battle that we all fight every day in our life. Amen? I believe it can be a picture of our nation. America, in my eyes, has come to a similar place. When I see us losing our moral character. I was watching something today. Uh, they were talking about different, different legislation concerning women or mothers. But they didn't refer to them as women or mothers. They referred to them as birthing people. And one of the legislators said, why are y'all saying birthing people instead of mothers? Who else gives birth? But, you know, they, they're, they're trying to be sensitive to this gender nonsense that's going on. Let me tell you something. God made a man and he made a woman and that's it. There was nothing else. And it's God who determines your gender, not yourself. Hello. What's the old saying? You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig, right? You know? A dog is born a dog. A cat is born a cat. A man is born a man. A woman is born a woman. Hello. But I see our moral, moral character being torn away. Schools encouraging lifestyles that, that are sinful. People say you can choose whatever you want. Nothing, nothing's bad. We've let our hands down and the enemy's attacked. Recently we had a lunar eclipse which created what's called a blood moon. The moon turns red like blood. And I had people ask me, Pastor, is this a prophetic sign? And my response is yes. It's not necessarily the fulfillment of a biblical prophetic sign, but I believe it's a message from God. See, God created the heavens, and, and it says He put the sun, the moon, the stars there for signs, and then for seasons, and for other things. But, but one of the main reasons that God put it there was for a sign for us. And when I look at that blood moon, and I, you know, I watched that happen like many of you did, it was more than just a blood moon. It was more than just a lunar eclipse. I know those things happen a lot. But one of the things that I didn't realize till later is that that blood moon was in, in a certain constellation at that time. They're all in some constellation. But this time, it happened to be in the constellation Libra, which is the scales. See, God said you're going to be weighed in the balances. Are your sins forgiven? See, see, when we're weighed in the balances, we come out wanting, lacking, because sin has weighed us down. But when the blood of Jesus hits the other side of the scale, we're okay. Amen. And see, this, this blood moon took place while it was on the scales, while it was in the balances. And to me, that was a picture of God saying, hey, look, you are like the moon. See, the moon was made on the fourth day. The sun, moon, stars, they were made on the fourth day. And the moon is called a light that shines in the night. But in reality, the moon is not a light. See, the moon is just made of dust. It's not like the sun. The sun's a light. The moon is just a dead dust planet out there. But the light it shines is a reflection of the sun. And see, that's who we are. See, see, we got saved. Jesus came to save mankind on the fourth day. And we are not the light. He is the light of the world. We are just made out of dust. But the light that we're supposed to shine, see, Jesus said, let your light shine. But in all, in all honesty, we don't have a light. The only light we have is being a reflection of the Son of God. Amen. So the moon is a picture of believers. And, and when I saw that light going out and the blood of Jesus, I thought, ooh, that's God sending a message saying, hey, look, you're going to be weighed in the balances. 
And you're supposed to let your light shine. Your light's not shining right now. And Jesus shed his blood for you. You're covered by the blood of Jesus. And you're going to be waiting the balance. Boy, when that thing was over, I thought, we need to shout it out loud. Let your light shine. Amen. That's the call of God. I believe he was reminding us. Saying, Look, I'm coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And you need to get right or you're going to get left. Amen. You're going to be weighed in the balances. You're not going to be judged by uh, you know, how good you are compared to your neighbors. You're not going to be judged whether or not your yard one yard of the month. And I hope it did. That's great. Congratulations if you did. You're not going to be judged whether you got to be on the school board or you got elected to some office or you, you made a certain amount of income. You're going to be judged based on the, the Word of God. Amen. And that's all. The pure Word of God. And I want to tell you something. We come out short and we need the blood of Jesus to wash our sins away. Amen. And I want to tell you something. Jesus is coming soon. And I believe that was a sign from the Lord saying, hey, look, He's coming soon. Get right. Amen. We need to get right with God. We can't blame our problems on the media or on the, the gangs, or on the government, or, or on Putin, or anything else. Because God never called upon them. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, He said, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. We need to take responsibility for ourselves. Amen? It's time for the church to rise up and lift up the name of Jesus. Get prayer back in public schools. Amen. It's time to invite friends and neighbors to church. It's time for the church to awaken. Rephidim was a place that meant laziness. The church needs to wake up. We can't get lazy. Christianity is not for wimps. Whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, we're all engaged in spiritual warfare. And it was Yeshua who was doing the battle, who was doing the fighting. See, when it comes to spiritual warfare, the only way we can win is if Yeshua, Jesus, our Savior, is fighting on our behalf and we are worshiping God. Amen? Amen. The enemy is out to destroy you and, and me. But if we'll worship God, then God does the fighting on our behalf. We can never win in spiritual warfare because we have a strong will, but rather because we have a strong Savior. Amen? It's not willpower that gives us victory, but worship and word power. Amen? There's not an individual in this place or viewing or listening that's going to defeat the devil by willpower. In Romans 7, 19, the Apostle Paul said this, For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law in my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, which is part of us. We're born in sin. He says this in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. See, Paul is saying, I can't win this battle on my own. I try, but I'm born in sin. I need Yeshua, the Savior, to battle for me. And I want to tell you something, if the Apostle Paul needs Jesus' help, if the Apostle Peter needed the help of Jesus, if Moses needed Jesus, if Abraham needed Jesus, I want to tell you something, you need Jesus, amen. There's no other way. The only way we have victory is if we depend on the Lord, amen. I believe the church in America is about to see its greatest hour. It's harvest time. Jesus is coming soon. I believe Gabriel's policy is trumpet, amen. We have an opportunity to let our light shine. It's a dark time. We should be inviting friends and neighbors to church. This morning, uh, when I got here, it was raining a little heavy. And uh, I was you know, cleaning some things up. And uh, the lights flickered and then they went out. I thought, oh, I hope they come back on quick. <laughs> and of course, the emergency lights came on. 
And if you've ever been home and, and there was a storm and the lights went out, the power went out, one of the first things you do, if it's nighttime, mm -hmm. is you look for a candle, don't you? Yeah, you know, look for a flashlight. You get your phone and turn on the flashlight, you know. And uh, I was thinking about that. When things get dark, that's what we do. We, we, we look for a light. And in 2020, things got dark, didn't they? <laughs> and, uh, and things have been getting dark. I was thinking about my daughters. I mentioned this last week. Uh, it's May, and so they went to see my niece graduate uh, Pepperdine University in California. And when they were there, they rented a car, and they got the shock of their life, not when they rented the car, but when they tried to put gas in it. <coughs> California gas is seven and eight dollars a gallon. They called that. <laughs> gas over here is seven fifty a gallon. <laughs> They said, we went to a really nice restaurant. We didn't get much because it was too expensive. It was nice. They said, we, we, got, we, we realized after that first restaurant, we need to go to some regular restaurants. And then they went to those and said, it's almost just as expensive there. And uh, they looked at their budget and said, we better go to Kroger. Amen. <laughs> Buy a loaf of bread and some lunch meat. So they did that. And the lunch meat was $25. They said, uh, stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas, amen. We want to go back home. We can't afford this, amen. But things are tough, and when things get tough, people start looking for a light, don't they? And, and that's our job. We're to be that light. We need to let our light shine. But remember, we're like the moon. We're not really a light. The only light in us is a reflection of Jesus in our life. See, for a lot of people, you're the only Bible they'll ever read. For a lot of people, you're the only Jesus they'll ever see. Is the Jesus in you? Turn to somebody and say, let your light shine. Amen. Let your light shine. The darker it gets, the brighter the light shines. There's no better time to let your light or your love shine than right now. Another reason I believe we need to pray and bring America back to God is because there's only two options when it comes to sin. Either you get rid of sin or sin gets rid of you. It's sort of like Osama bin Laden and the terrorists that he sponsored. They had bombed the World Trade Center and we didn't get rid of it. Then they bombed several American embassies around the world. We didn't get rid of it. Then they bombed the U.S. naval ship, the Cole, and we didn't get rid of it. Then they destroyed the World Trade Center's towers in New York and killed thousands of people. And the only reason those attacks have stopped here in America is because we finally got rid of it. <laughs> See, sin's like a cancer. If you don't kill it, it'll kill you. Hello. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 3, the prophet Samuel gave instructions to King Saul. He said, now go and smite Amalek. Remember Amalek? That's sin. He said, get rid of sin. He goes, he said, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not and slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, sheep, camel and ass. And, and, and some people say, well, why does God so mean? They represented sin. And God was saying, get rid of sin. See, God's not worried about a person dying because this life is like a vapor. It's here one moment, gone the next year in turn. We, we don't see death like God does. God sees death as passing from death to life. From temporary to eternity. But he said, get rid of sin. Completely. And in verse 8 of 1 Samuel 15, it, it talks about what King Saul did. It says, he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So what he did was, he got rid of almost all the sin. Almost all of them. But he just kept one in a lot. Sometimes we do the same thing. But we're living a good life and we're doing a lot of things right. It's just that one thing that we do. Well, we know it's wrong, but we're letting it live. <laughs> we know we shouldn't do that. We know we shouldn't take that. We know we shouldn't be there, whatever it might be. But we do it anyway. We let that one sin. He let one Amalekite live. Just one, the king. Maybe he thought he could get some money out of him or some uh, 
gold or I, I don't know why, but he let that one sin live. He killed the pets, the livestock, the other men, women, children. And then when you read 2 Samuel chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, we read about the death of King Saul. And it says, David said to the young man that told him, How do you know? How knowest thou that Samuel and Jonathan his son be dead? He brought reports to King uh, David. You know, that King uh, Saul is dead, and his son Jonathan is dead. Here's his crown, and here's his bracelet. And, and the young man told him, said, Well, as I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. When he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called unto me. And I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? And I answered, I am Malachi. Boy, that had a sting. Boy, that had a sting. King Saul was told before, get rid of all the Amalekites. And he almost did. He got rid of them all except for one. And now here's the point in his life where he's about to be killed. And he sees this person. He says, who, is, who are you that's about to kill me? Well, you remember me? I'm, I'm the sin you never got rid of. You didn't destroy me, so now I'm going to destroy you. That had to be tough. He said to me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me. For anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him, and I slew him. I killed him. How sure that he couldn't live. And after that, he was fallen. He died. And I took the crown that was on his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and I brought them here to you, my Lord. I'm the sin that Saul didn't kill. I killed him. Folks, let me tell you something about sin. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. You get rid of the sin before it gets rid of you. Amen? Amalek and Rephidim. See, Amalek fought in a place called Rephidim. It means a resting place there. Where you get a little lazy, you let your hands down, you, you're, you're off guard, you're, you're not being observed, you get careless. Sometimes we we stop going to church or we quit reading as much as we did or praying. Listen, get on the Lord, Jesus is coming soon, amen. Get right or get left, amen. Worship God, serve God, get rid of the sin, all the sin, because if you don't get rid of the sin, the sin will get rid of you. The Bible makes it clear. Let's stand together. Well, thanks for watching the program. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'd love to invite you to come out and join us for service here at Christian Life Center. We're located right here in Kingwood, Texas, behind the Fine Arts Community Center called the Nathaniel Center. Uh, our building is right behind it. We're in Building D. Our address is 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas, and the zip is 77339. Listen, Christian Life Center is a church designed to meet the needs of the entire family. We have programs for single and married adults and kiddos of all ages. <laughs> Vacation Bible School is coming up soon uh, in July, and your kids will love it. This year's theme is called Joy Story, and we're going to have some of the uh, vehicles from the movie Cars out here and some characters in costume. The kids are going to love it. We have a great uh, daycare and Christian school that your children can be a part of. And uh, come out and join us. If you need more information, give us a call. Our phone number is 713-398-9282. And would you consider uh, sowing a seed into the ministry? You know, you can text an offering uh, by simply calling the number on your screen, 844-297-9517. Uh, 844-297-9517. Nine five one seven. You can text an offering of any amount to that number, and we'll receive it, and you'll have a record of your giving. Once again, thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed the service, and we're looking forward to seeing you here at Christian Life Center in the near future. God bless you.